And for tonight, we have three faculty members who will be speaking to us. And so we have Dr. Bath from St. Agnes Medical Center, Dr. Chung from UCSF, and Dr. Zhou from Stanford University. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. And so follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and uh, thank you again from NCSCG and SCSG. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my share. Dr. Bath, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting your share as I introduce you. So Dr. Bath, she is a California native and second year internal medicine resident from Fresno in Fresno, California. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Bath has an interest in gastroenterology and hepatology that began in, in medical school during uh, the preclinical years. Dr. Bath is applying for fellowship this upcoming year during chief year and future career goals include being able to be involved in academics as Dr. Bath enjoys teaching and research. A research topic that uh, Dr. Bath finds captivating is the brain gut microbiome access and its involvement in the development of various health conditions. So thank you, Dr. Bath, for, um, for presenting to us today on resident performed point of care ultrasound compared to standard radiology study and diagnosis of liver pathology. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a uh, research project I did during my intern year last year. Um, I just was at DDW a few weeks ago, um, also got the opportunity to present it there. Um, the, I just want to also point out that um, for us, point of care ultrasound um, is the handheld ultrasound. Uh, we use the butterfly. Um, let me see if I can, all right. Just a disclosure, um, we didn't have any financial support, no relationships, didn't sign any type of contractors, have any type of sponsor, uh, purely just done through my residency program. So a lot of this is um, well known. The, the main reason that we did this project was to see if um, um, handheld ultrasound could be used uh, for point of care ultrasound, uh, POCUS. Um, in our residency programs and just in ED physicians and primary care, point of care ultrasound is increasingly used. Um, we use it all the time. We're taught, you know, cardiac echo, uh, pulmonary imaging. It's um, done all the time. However, we found that um, there was not as much use in liver imaging for this. And uh, there was actually no uh, research that had been done yet for this. Um, some of the uses, as we know, HCC screening, identifying ascites, uh, liver span, fatty liver, um, given the high prevalence of liver disease, and the, and it affect fatty liver disease affecting about 25 of the pop, 25 percent of the population and increasing uh, progression to cirrhosis requiring transplant. Um, there's a very high uh, economic burden on the healthcare system, approximately $2.5 billion in direct costs yearly, and then 10.6 billion costs in indirect, um, indirect costs. And this is really important in detecting, in early detection of liver disease. And um, just to kind of throw out some numbers, uh, total annual cost of care per uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease patient with private insurance is about uh, $7,800. Um, for a new diagnosis, about 3,700, and for long-term management uh, compared to those who have the same risk factors, but um, in sim similar metabolic co comorbidities, um, but without non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's a fraction of that cost at only about $22,000 a year. So the, out of all of that cost, the largest cost is liver biopsies. Um, the main reason we wanted to do this is for us um, inpatient as residents, um, ordering liver ultrasound, just being able to have, knowing if we can do point of care ultrasound at bedside can kind of speed up time to diagnosis, even in our primary care clinic where we're seeing elevated liver enzymes, just being able to have that handheld ultrasound, take a quick look at the liver and kind of begin to form the diagnosis earlier on. So just a kind of a device cost comparison, um, standard ultrasound machines can cost anywhere from $25,000 to $200,000, average is about 115K. Um, and then handheld ultrasounds, they are, the one that we used was about $2,300. Um, they range anywhere from about this much to I've seen about 10,000. Um, this was something for our program and my residency, all of our attendings have it, some of the residents have it. So it's very um, easy for us to grab, grab one of these and just scan the patient. Our objectives for our research um, was to see whether internal medicines can perform point of care ultrasound uh, for two reasons. One, to diagnose liver pathology. What we mean by liver pathology is can we identify normal liver, hepatic steatosis, cirrhosis, and then 
presence or absence of liver masses. And then the second was to assess the presence or absence of hepatomegaly. So how do we define that? So our hepatomegaly diagnosis was defined as a liver span of greater than 16 centimeters uh, measured with the probe at the midclavicular line of the patient. And we measured the liver span from the most inferior aspect of the liver that sits right above the diaphragm to the liver tip. Um, how did we diagnose our liver pathology? So it fell into one of three uh, final diagnoses, normal fatty or cirrhosis. So the four, um, the four aspects that we looked at in imaging was the echogenicity uh, in comparison to the kidney, echo texture, the border, and then the presence or absence of periportal fat. Um, in a normal liver, um, echogenicity would be similar to the kidney or less. Um, the echo texture would be nice and smooth, homogenous, um, and the borders would be nice and smooth. Given that there's not um, too much fat, you'd still be able to identify periportal fat around the vessels. Um, and then in fatty liver, you will have, because of the deposition of fat, echogenicity would be more than the kidney. It'll show up a lot brighter. Um, the echo texture remains smooth and homogenous. Um, the borders are smooth, but given the presence of all the fat deposition, you do have loss of that distinct periportal fat. Um, and then as far as cirrhosis, uh, echogenicity is more than the kidney. It shows up nice and very bright. Uh, the echo texture now, however, becomes more co coarse and heterogeneous. Um, the border is now irregular and more so nodular. And then you can also see the presence or absence of typically ascites as well. So here's some images. Um, on the leftmost side, you will see a normal liver. You can see that, as, we, um, as I mentioned, the diaphragm is there. It's the nice bright spot right under the liver and measuring that from the tip. And the kidney there is right, uh, right next to it, showing up a lot brighter. Then we have in the second image, uh, the liver span is uh, greatly increased in comparison to the left. The liver is a lot more brighter than the kidney. Um, and then on the image on the far right, you can see there is a presence of perihepatic ascites and the liver is very, very bright and shrunken as we would see in cirrhosis. So materials and methods, um, there was three of us uh, internal medicine residents last year who participated and we enrolled 51 patients. Um, our ultrasound training was we had four hands-on training sessions that lasted from 60 to 90 minutes with our attending. Um, and basically it was a mixture of our attending showing us um, all the different types of fatty liver, uh, examples of fatty liver, normal liver, um, different mechanisms on how to get best liver imaging, having them lay on their right side, having them take a deep inspiration, holding their breath. So it was a mixture of um, us practicing and our attending showing us examples. The device that we used was the Butterfly IQ. It was a single probe handheld ultrasound and it connected to our cell phones. From this device, um, you were able to take pictures and uh, also refer back to those images later. However, we, in, um, we did not share those images with each other or our attending. Um, we were the only ones who, who saw them. And we also were able to make uh, videos as well of, um, of the liver as well. So we had a collection of photos and um, videos as well uh, to refer back to when we were doing our data collection. Um, the way we identified our subjects was through our, CERN, our hospital EMR Cerner has a this radiology database where we can search anyone who's getting liver ultrasounds done in the whoever has one ordered, whether in the ED, inpatient or outpatient. Um, and for any reason, whether it being transaminitis, abdominal pain, ascites, um, anyone who had a liver ultrasound um, was eligible except for those, we did not include those who um, we're getting liver imaging outpatient. Um, we, uh, the official ultrasound report, um, there was still an official ultrasound along with our point of care handheld ultrasound. That report was only ever reviewed by our attending who documented um, whether our findings were, uh, were, aligned, were aligned with the standard radiology or different. And we remained blinded throughout the entirety of the study. So the results, just to kind of give an idea about our patient characteristics of our 51 patients, it's a good 50-50 of males and females, 25 males, 26 females. The BMI ranged from 17.6 to 48.3. Um, as far as patient comorbidities, about a third of our patients had diabetes, two thirds had hypertension, about half of them had hyperlipidemia, all risk factors for NASH that we documented 
um, as well as a history of alcohol abuse, about 27%. So from the 51 livers, uh, the radiologist reports revealed 15 normal livers, 29 with hepatic steatosis, four cirrhotic livers, and three with liver masses, um, and with the respective percentages there. Our resident performed point of care ultrasound for final diagnosis. Um, it identified eight false negatives and two false positives. So here in table two, for final diagnosis, um, our sensitivity uh, was 77%, specificity was 86.6%, positive predictive value was 93.3%, and negative predictive value was 61.9%. And this was in final diagnosis, meaning normal liver, fatty liver, cirrhosis, presence or absence of liver masses. Um, <clears throat> and then for our second objective, which was identifying hepatomegaly, um, for the radiologist reports revealed 20, so 29% of our patient population had hepatomegaly, and our report revealed um, we had eight false negatives. So our sensitivity, our sensitivity for detection of hepatomegaly was 60%, our specificity was 100%, positive predictive value was 100%, and negative predictive value was 73, 73%. So just, <clears throat> uh, just kind of discussing just the point of care, what we found point of care compared to standard ultrasound. Um, some of the, I reviewed some meta-analyses that compared the ability of standard ultrasound just for some percentages to compare our results to. Um, the, as far as histology, a lot of these studies um, that were involved in this meta-analysis done by Hernais et al. Um, were the gold standard for the diagnosis ultimately was liver biopsy, which we did not have. But just um, for as far as histology, um, clinically significant steatosis can range from parenchymal involvement mild being five to 33% uh, called grade one, moderate being from 34 to 66% being grade two, or severe being greater than 66% grade three. So in the 34 studies that were included in the meta-analysis, about 2,800 patients, a revealed ultrasound can detect fatty liver with the histology as gold standard. Um, sensitivity for that moderate, like so from grade two to three, histo um, histologically defined fatty liver was about 84%. And then specificity was 93%. However, if you were, um, however, they uh, noticed that if you uh, include all grades, grade one, two, and three, um, this sensitivity drops fr from 53.3 to 65 percent, and sensitivity, sorry, specificity drops from 77 to 81 percent. Um, that's if all grades are considered. And another study done um, as far as detection of standard. Um, standard ultrasound uh, detection of hepatomegaly with 148 patients revealed that standard ultrasound, the sensitivity was about 84% and specificity was about 90%. Um, so just to kind of summarize, this was the first study um, done by residents to uh, evaluate uh, point of care ultrasound using handheld ultrasound sound for liver, liver disease. Um, we believe that with additional, with additional training, residents do have the potential to accurately diagnose liver pathology um, by using our protocol and also receiving just hands-on training. Um, we believe that it's important because it can help expedite efficient diagnosis and uh, reduce uh, overall length of hospital stay and expenses with um, standard imaging. Um, next steps that we have are performing a larger study with more residents and patients, um, including patients receiving outpatient imaging, um, just to include that, part, that group as well. And some of the study limits are inter-research um, inter variability in image interpretation. Um, we did have a small patient size, sample size. We didn't have a liver biopsy for a gold standard comparison. Medicine, um, besides just the comparison to the standard radiology study. And then some of the limits just of ultrasound in general are um, overestimation of steatosis um, that can happen in more obese patients due to beam attenuation um, from the overlying fat rather than the actual liver. Um, echogenicity can also be uh, confounded by the fi other fibrosis inflammation present as well. And sometimes fibrosis and fat can also just superficially look alike um, because both do cause um, the liver to be more hypoechogenic. Um, 
And thank you so much for allowing me to share my research. Uh, if you have any questions. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Bath. Uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, one of the, the points that have been made by one of our um, uh, chairs is, uh, one of the board members is uh, consider adding FibroScan in the future studies, which I, I think is, is definitely really great. Uh, I don't think their butterflies have FibroScan yet, but uh, maybe one, one day in the future, they'll be able to have that mm -hmm. and that'll definitely in increase our abilities. Yeah, I think we can definitely, when we include our next, um, we're, we are starting our next uh, phase with more patients and including the outpatient. I think with outpatient, we could definitely follow up those patients with FibroScan for sure. Okay. Um, again, anyone, if you have any other questions, just uh, please post it in the chat box and we can uh, mention them to Dr. Bath. One, one thing that I was curious about was um, over time as you were doing the study, uh, mm -hmm. Did you notice any changes in terms of your, your accuracy or, uh, because I would assume as, as you get more experience, you get better at, at, at doing these studies and does that, does that, did, did you guys ever test to see time difference from beginning to end in terms of sensitivity and specificity? We actually didn't, but I was definitely consider, considering doing that as we do our next 50 patients that we're starting on. Um, and uh, the uh, so the group of three of us, I actually went and got more training, uh, official training as well uh, by the Society of Hospital Medicine. Um, so we're also, my residency program is also starting a, like we're creating the, the POCUS curriculum here. So we're hoping that we can actually um, collect that data as well. Um, kind of making sure that we're documenting all the patient data chronologically and then going from there and seeing over like um, for those who are going to attend this workshop that we're doing and those who already have been trained elsewhere, like if there's, um, if there's a difference in that as well. Got it. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, sound like someone maybe had a question, but uh... all right. Dr. Bath, thanks so much again for your time. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Cha. Uh, so if you're able to unshare your screen and Dr. Cha, if you can share yours, that'd be great. Uh, so Dr. Cha, she is an advanced IBD fellow in gastroenterologist at UCSF. Uh, she received her MD from Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University and completed her internal medicine residency at, um, uh -oh, at uh, Montefiore Health Systems uh, in Bronx, New York. Uh, she was a GI fellow and chief fellow at Yale, uh, New Haven in Connecticut. All right, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, providing us uh, your, your time with this. Of course, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about upadacitinib and then specifically a study that we did uh, related to that. I have no uh, relevant disclosures. So I first just want to talk a little bit about the JAK-STAT pathway and JAK inhibitors in general. Um, so as many of you may know, JAK inhibitors are now very commonly being used in our inflammatory bowel disease population. The first one that was FDA approved was tofacitinib, and that was in 2018. Um, and then more recently, we've had upadacitinib approved, and then also filgotinib is currently undergoing studies as well. Um, and so just to uh, review the JAKSTAT pathway briefly, um, so as you may recall, some the there are cytokines that attach to the receptors on the cell surface. And that is what uh, kind of triggers the activation of these JAK or, JAK or Janus kinase enzymes. And there are a few different types. There's JAK1, JAK3, TIC2. And then that as a result kind of triggers the STAT pathway, which will also trigger this pro-inflammatory response. And so the purpose of these medications, as the name suggests, is to really block jack and therefore block that inflammatory pathway from occurring. And this image is actually from a paper that was published in 2021, but just the updates here are that upadacitinib, as I mentioned, is now FDA approved for use in ulcerative colitis. And there is preliminary phase three data available for Crohn's disease that's promising. And filgotinib has been approved for use uh, in ulcerative colitis in Europe. So it is actually being used in Europe as well as Japan, I believe, um, but not yet in the United States. 
And so just to briefly review the two JAK inhibitors and compare the two, these are the two JAK inhibitors that are approved for use in the United States for um, in IBD. So there's tofacitinib, also known by its brand name, Zeljans. And as I mentioned, that's a pan-JAK inhibitor targeting all of those three Janus kinase enzymes that I mentioned. And then upadacitinib is specific to JAK1, also known by its brand name, Rinbok. Um, Tofacitinib has been FDA approved for uh, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, as well as um, juvenile arthritis and ulcerative colitis. And upadacitinib is approved for use in atopic dermatitis, psoriatic arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. In terms of dosing for tofacitinib, the recommended induction dose is 10 twice daily, and maintenance can be either 5 or 10 twice daily. Um, and the recommended dosing for upadacitinib, at least in ulcerative colitis, is to start at 45 milligrams and then drop to 30. Um, in terms of its use in ulcerative colitis, TOFA was approved in 2018. Upadacitinib was just approved in March of 2022. Um, and Crohn's, and for use in Crohn's disease, we've seen no benefit over placebo for TOFA, but we have seen promising outcomes in phase two and phase three clinical trials for upadacitinib. Their safety profile is pretty similar. And for both of these medications, at least in the United States, they can only be utilized if the patient has already previously failed an anti-TNF agent. And I just want to briefly review the phase three clinical trial data um, in Crohn's disease. And this has actually only been released as a press release. Um, so this is the preliminary data. It hasn't uh, you know, come out as a published study yet. Um, and what I've done is written in red here the difference from placebo um, when looking at clinical remission based on CDAI score, as well as stool frequency and abdominal pain score. Um, and then also looking at endoscopic response. And these are the two studies uh, that looked at response to induction in Crohn's disease. And as you can see, compared to placebo, the response is actually pretty good. I mean, usually with our meds, we see uh, a difference from placebo in the teens, maybe in the 20s. And here we're seeing endoscopic response in you know like 30% or more, which is really uh, pretty amazing. Um, and so the goal of our study was to really uh, assess the efficacy and safety of upadacitinib in this group of medically refractory patients with Crohn's disease. So as I mentioned, although upadacitinib has not been FDA approved in Crohn's disease yet, over the last couple of years, we've had several patients who have just failed all of the FDA approved medications. And so we've tried using uh, upadacitinib off-label for them. Um, and so I identified these patients by looking through at this uh, Tableau database that we have that's linked to our EMR. And so I just searched for all patients that had been prescribed upadacitinib. The inclusion criteria was uh, being an adult patient, so over 18 years of age, um, with a diagnosis of Crohn's disease and having either actively taken or previously taken upadacitinib. The primary outcomes that we looked at were clinical remission and clinical response. And I've defined what, you know, what we used as the criteria for remission and response. And this is based on the same criteria that was used in clinical trials. And then we also looked at adverse events. And so um, we started off with 29 patients who were prescribed upadacitinib um, and ultimately ended up with 14 total patients on uh, UPA that we decided to include in the study. And so there were eight that actually, uh, once we prescribed it, the insurance appeal was denied. One was receiving UPA as part of a clinical trial, so we excluded that patient. Um, there were a few that after approval, declined to take the medication due to concerns regarding safety or cost. And then some patients were actually lost to follow up after the initial prescription. And so this is, these are the um, patient and disease characteristics. So as I mentioned, we had 14 patients, majority female, uh, median age was 44. Um, none of them were former or current smokers. And as you can see, 73% had perianal disease and 57% um, had both small bowel and uh, colon involvement. And the disease duration uh, was actually a median of 15 years. And just looking at more characteristics, so there, these are their baseline lab parameters. Um, and then in terms of prior medication use, just to kind of 
show really how refractory these patients were. 100% of them had been on an anti-TNF, 100% had been on Vito, and 100% had been on East Ustekinumab. And actually 43% had been on three or more anti-TNF agents. 29% had also tried dual biologic therapy in the past. Um, so pretty refractory population. Um, and then actually we included all patients on UPA, even if UPA wasn't the indication or, the, or rather Crohn's disease wasn't the indication for them receiving upadacitinib. Um, so we actually had, um, if you look on the bottom here, 12 of the 14 were, were prescribed upadacitinib for Crohn's, but one was receiving it for inflammatory arthritis and one was receiving it for uh, my management of pyoderma. In terms of the doses that were utilized in these patients, um, we actually were pretty uh, aggressive with our dosing. So for induction, most of these patients received 45 milligrams daily, which is the highest approved dose. And so 64% received that for induction. But what was more surprising was that even for the maintenance dose for these patients, 50% remained on 45 milligrams daily in our practice. In terms of clinical response and remission, we actually had really, really good response. Um, so I want to mention that we only looked at clinical response and remission in those 12 patients who received upadacitinib for Crohn's and not for other indications. And we found that there was a 42% clinical response, or sorry, clinical remission rate uh, and a 67% clinical response rate at three months. And then at most recent follow-up, it was um, the same numbers, but I will mention that these weren't the same patients. So there were some patients who had response at three months and then lost response. And then there were some patients who, you know, didn't at see, we didn't see any response at three months, but then did see it at most recent follow-up. Um, and I and I'll also mentioned there was one patient where we dropped her dose from 45 milligrams to 30 milligrams during the maintenance phase, and she lost response. And that's, I think, why we were so kind of aggressive about keeping patients on the 45 milligram dose for maintenance. Um, and then below are also comparing some of the inflammatory markers over time. In terms of adverse events, we had several, seven total adverse events occurring in six patients. Um, the one serious adverse event was a deep vein thrombus occurring in a patient who was on 45 milligrams daily. Um, but I will say that in this situation, uh, it wasn't totally convincing if this patient had developed a new thrombus or if this was an old thrombus that just occurred during the time when the patient was actively inflamed. And then we just happened to find it later on while the patient was on UPA. Um, there were also two incidents of dyslipidemia, two incidents of LFT abnormalities, and then one incident of leukopenia on the 45 milligram daily dose that then resolved with decreasing the dose to 30 milligrams daily. So that's pretty much it for our study, but I do want, since UPA is a relatively new drug, I just want to touch upon um, kind of where UPA now falls into our algorithm because there are so many drugs um, out there for IBD now. And so um, I think this article is pretty excellent. It was published in the Lancet just earlier this year, and it's a systematic review and meta-analysis um, looking at 29 total studies. This is just a network map um, looking at um, uh, looking at the induction trials, assessing clinical remission in patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. So once again, this is for UC, not for Crohn's. Um, and you can see that uh, this map um, here, the node size corresponds to the number of study participants for each intervention. And then the connection size corresponds to the number of studies for each comparison. Um, and so this table I know is very overwhelming, but I'm gonna just explain it quickly. Um, so in pink are all the medications that they were looking at. So upadacitinib, ozanamide, filgotinib, et cetera. And I know some of these medications have not yet been approved in the United States, but are being used in Europe. And then in, in the violet or purple colored boxes are um, essentially their, the numbers in purple are the odds ratios for, um, for how, I guess, beneficial the drug is over the one that it is being compared to. Um, and, and if it was clinically significant, they put it in purple. And um, along the x-axis, they're looking at endoscopic improvements. And then along the y-axis, they're looking at, um, at clinical remission. 
And so essentially what they found here was that um, all the medications were superior to placebo with the exception of filgotinib 100. And they found um, that the medications inferior to infliximab, which has really been our best medication before upadacitinib came along, um, were adalimumab, etralizumab, filgotinib 100 and filgotinib 200. But what they did find was that um, upadacitinib was significantly superior to all other uh, interventions, and it ranked the highest for induction of clinical remission. And so they calculated the super score, which is the surface under the cumulative ranking curve, and um, it's graded on a scale of zero to 100 percent. And the closer to 100 percent you are, basically that means um, that is that would indicate uh, the overall ranking and um, how successful the drug is above the others. And so the super score for upadacitinib was 99.6% compared to 77.1% for infliximab. So basically indicating that it's a very, very effective medication. And this, once again, I just kind of circled in yellow here on the table, uh, just showing that UPA does appear to be superior uh, to all other medications. And so just key takeaways, um, so a few things that I wanted to highlight were that clinical remission and response rates with upadacitinib suggest significant efficacy for management of patients with severe refractory Crohn's disease. And so we are hoping to get uh, to see upadacitinib approved for Crohn's soon. Adverse events of upadacitinib are similar to those of tofacitinib and those seen in clinical trials. And that doses of 45 milligrams of upadacitinib upadacitinib may be necessary in cases of severe um, disease. These were my co-authors, so I just want to thank them, of course, for their contributions to this project. Um, and then here's my email as well, if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cho, for your time. This is great. And uh, thank you so much for, for helping us with this. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, I may have missed this part, but uh, the patients who are responders, um, clinical responders and patients that had clinical remission, how many of those um, had prior TOFA exposure? Yeah, great question. So actually 20, um, okay, so out of the ones who achieved clinical response and remission, none of them had TOFA exposure. So we did specifically look at, we had 20% of the 14, so that's like, you know, just a few patients were previously on TOFA, and I specifically looked at that subset, and none of them uh, responded to upadacitinib. Okay, which would make sense. So I guess if, if yeah. you're not going to respond to TOFA, there's no no point of trying upadacitinib potentially. Yeah. It okay. seems like it, yeah. Got it. Um, do you think this, uh, I don't know if anyone has any other questions, please just chime in if, if since we're not seeing anything in the chat box here. But, uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. But I didn't want to interrupt you. No, it's okay, Mikhail, I, I can go after it. Please, you go. Thank you so much. Um, the question is this, uh, you start induction dose of 45, and yes. then 50% of the pay, of the patients will, con will continue 45, or you try to go down to 30, and they lost response, and you would go up to 45? Yeah, so um, it was there was a bit of overlap. Um, so there were there were there was one patient where we went down to from forty five to thirty. She lost response. We went up to forty five. There were a couple of patients where actually we induced them or in initiated them on thirty milligrams, and then after three months they didn't show response, and so then we increased their dose to forty five. So it was almost like we did the reverse, like we did the induction on thirty and then maintenance on forty five, just because we didn't see them respond to the thirty. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the the final question I could think of is. Uh, now that you've shown the data that sort of it performs, it can potentially outperform infliximab, do you envision it potentially becoming the first line therapy since it's oral agent? Do you potentially see it as first choice potentially over some of these other infusion agents? Yeah, I mean, I think the issue is that at this point, the FDA has mandated that these JAK inhibitors not be used until patients have failed an anti-TNF first. And so I think at this point, we just can't, um, but, uh, but as I've shown with the study, there are ways around the FDA. And so, um, and so maybe, I mean, I think I would definitely think about giving it first line to some, to some patients. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow again. Um, and you. if you wouldn't mind unsharing, we'll have Dr. Zhou join us. 
So Dr. Margaret Zhou, she's a second year GI fellow and master's student in clinical research and epidemiology at Stanford University. She graduated from Stanford University in college, attaining a Bachelor of Science in Biology with Distinction. She then went up to UCSF for medical school, where she graduated also with distinction. She pursued her internal medicine residency at Columbia University and uh, fortunate for us, returned to Stanford for a GI fellowship. She is one of the GI chiefs this upcoming year. She's interested in epidemiologic uh, outcomes and uh, research in foregut cancers and plans to pursue clinical training in therapeutic endoscopy. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Zhou. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Mike, which screen are you seeing right now? Uh, that's, that's, yeah, I see your, your, your title slide, risk of proximal GI cancer. Okay, cool. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks so much for the intro. Um, so today I'm going to be giving an overview over one of the studies that I've been working on this past year, um, looking at uh, proximal GI cancer risk after fit testing. Um, so just to give some background, you know, we all know that fit is the leading non-invasive colon cancer screening test throughout the world. Um, and FIT detects occult blood through amino assays that measure antibody attachment to human globin with higher specificity for lower GI tract blood loss compared to guaiac FOBT. Um, however, over half of our patients who have a positive FIT still do not have any colon cancer or advanced adenomas during their colonoscopy. And so it remains a question of what is the significance of a positive FIT, especially in the absence of a colon cancer. Um, and could positive fit be a marker of increased proximal GI cancer risk? So the most recent 2017 guidelines from the US Multi-Society Task Force on Colon Cancer state that a positive fit and a negative colonoscopy should not prompt upper GI tract evaluation. This is a weak recommendation made on very low quality evidence. Um, and since these 2017 guidelines, this question has been addressed by two population-based cohorts. The first was reported in CGH in 2018, including 16,000 FIT-tested screening uh, patients in the Netherlands, where they found similar rates of esophageal, gastric, and small bowel cancers between FIT-positive versus FIT-negative patients. Um, they found a rate of upper GI cancers in the FIT-positive colonoscopy-negative group to be about twice that of the FIT-positive colonoscopy positive group, but this was not a significant difference. Then subsequently, a study performed in a colon cancer screening cohort in Korea of 6 million individuals um, found a, a higher absolute risk of proximal GI cancers um, in the fit positive versus fit negative patients. Um, and this was statistically significant in their adjusted analyses. And this risk was interestingly highest in those fit positive patients who actually had a colon cancer with a three-year risk of three, uh, over 3% 3 um, compared to those who are fit positive without colon cancer at 1.2% and lowest in the fit negative group. And so we wanted to evaluate this question in a multi-ethnic US-based society. Um, and we were able to do this with the Optum-based uh, cohort at the Stanford Center for Population Health and Sciences. So we wanted to evaluate the three-year risk of proximal GI cancers, which were esophageal, gastric, or small bowel in fit positive versus fit negative patients. And then to compare this risk of cancer between patients who, did, who had or did not have colorectal neoplasia, which we define as having a colon cancer or polyps. Um, and so our study population included uh, patients ages 50 to 61 in the Optum Clinformatic Data, Data Mart database. We excluded patients ages 62 or older because they would have had fewer than three years of follow-up before possibly transitioning to Medicare at age 65. And we identified the first FIT test performed between 20, 2004 and 2018 using LOINC codes associated with FIT testing specifically. We then excluded patients who had fewer than six months of continuous enrollment in the health plan prior to their first FIT test, or if they had IBD or a prior GI cancer. And so our primary outcome was a proximal GI cancer diagnosis within three years of the FIT test. We defined this as having at least two ICD-9 or 10 codes on at least two dates, seven days apart. Um, our observation time ranged from the start of the FIT test to our primary outcome or the end of the first continuous enrollment period, up to three years. And we analyzed missing data by uh, conducting a separate analysis for patients who did not have a FIT test result available. And these are usually patients who had their test um, uh, entered as a claim by a provider as opposed to an actual laboratory. Um, 
And then colorectal neoplasia within one year of fit was defined as having a colon cancer and polyp based on CPT codes using colonoscopy with polyp removal or actual ICD codes for a colorectal polyp. Um, we did a quick sample size estimation, which uh, estimated that we need probably um, about 7,000 fit positive or 70,000 fit negative patients to defect, detect the effect size we hope to see based on the Korean study. Um, so we were able to identify 191,000 patients in Optum who had a first time fit test. We excluded 38,000 of them, leaving us with about 153,000 patients um, to include. This in included 9,500 patients or 6% of our cohort who had a positive fit test, uh, uh, 123,000 uh, or 80% of our patients with a negative fit. And then there were almost 21,000 patients who did not have a fit result available. We conducted an analysis for them as well. Um, the baseline characteristics of our entire cohort included a median age of 56 with an intercortal range of 53 to 59. There were 54% of female patients. The predominant race was white at 58%, followed by um, Hispanic at 19% and black at 13%. And then over, about 66% of our patients actually had a bachelor degree or higher. We compared these baseline characteristics between our fit positive, fit negative, and, um, and the patients who did not have a fit result available. And those are similar overall. And the median follow-up time was three years. So of the patients who had a positive fit, 29% um, uh, of them had a colon cancer or a polyp, and the total rate of proximal GI cancer in that cohort was 0.25%. In comparison, our negative fit group had a total upper GI cancer rate of 0.07%. And then looking at the cohort of patients who did not have an actual fit result available, meaning that we didn't see a positive or a negative result in the claims database. Um, the rate of upper GI cancer is 0.09%. Um, and so here we break down the, the specific types of cancers a little bit more closely. So we had a total of 127 proximal GI cancers in the whole cohort. Um, most of these cancers comprised of gastric cancers um, and then followed by esophageal and small bowel. And again, we see um, that using chi-square testing, the, the rate of upper GI cancers between the negative and positive fits was significantly higher in the positive fit group. Um, we cannot show the numbers that are less than 11 due to often reporting restrictions, um, but we can see with at least the gastric cancer subtype, um, the rate in the positive fit group was 0.14% compared to 0.04% in the negative fit group. And that was also significant with chi-square testing. Um, something else that I think should be noted is that uh, because we were able to actually analyze the patients who did not have a fit result available, um, the results in that cohort seems to be approximately a weighted average of the positive and negative fit outcomes, which is reassuring that we're not systematically biasing our results by analyzing patients only who have a available fit result. Um, so then for our primary analysis, we performed Cox proportional hazards models to investigate the association between having a positive fit um, and uh, in association with the developing a proximal GI cancer in three years. And so adjusting for age, sex, race, or ethnicity, and presence of colon cancer within a year, the adjusted hazards ratio for developing an upper GI cancer in the positive fit patients was 3.2. And that was statistically significant with a 95% confidence interval of two to five. And then in a similar analysis, adjusting instead for presence of colorectal neoplasia, again, that's either a colon cancer or a polyp, the, the adjusted hazards ratio was slightly attenuated, but still significant at 2.9, um, again, with a significant confidence interval. And so these findings suggest that having a positive fit may be, may be independently associated with increased proximal GI cancer risk compared to a negative fit. This, uh, uh, chart breaks down the incidence of the proximal GI cancers by both fit result as well as colorectal neoplasia. And so uh, it gives the rates of proximal GI cancers diagnosed. And the fit positive group, um, we see uh, that this rate was higher in the fit positive patients who had colorectal neoplasia demonstrated by the black bar at about 0.4%. In comparison, <coughs> sorry, um, the rate in the FIT positive group without colorectal neoplasia was 0.19%. And so interestingly, this kind of goes against what my initial hypothesis was, which was that 
the upper GI cancer risk would be highest in those FIT positive patients who did not have any colorectal pathology. Instead, we're seeing here that the highest risk group for having an upper GI cancer is really those FIT positive patients who have colorectal neoplasia. Um, again, we see that a similar trend exists in the FIT negative group in that the, the rate of upper GI cancer is higher in the FIT negative group with colorectal neoplasia, the black bar again, compared to the FIT negative group without colorectal neoplasia. Um, and so, you know, this, char this chart really suggests that it's really the highest risk for upper GI cancer that we see is in those FIT positive patients. Um, and it's even higher in the patients who are FIT positive and have a colorectal neoplasia. So um, we then, to strengthen this analysis, performed additional COX models stratifying by FIT result to investigate the association between colorectal neoplasia and developing a proximal GI cancer. And so we selected these models to reflect clinical decision making for patients undergoing FIT testing. And, you know, we first identify what is the FIT result, and then as a next step, um, you know, is colon cancer or neoplasia present, and does it impact your risk of upper GI cancer? And so in model one here, we look just at patients who are FIT positive um, and adjusting again for age, sex, and race or ethnicity, we found a significantly elevated risk of proximal GI cancers in patients with colon cancer of 5.8, um, the adjusted hazard ratio. Um, and then in uh, model 1B, we look at um, having colorectal neoplasia, so either a colon cancer or polyp, and that risk was attenuated and no longer significant. However, the point estimate is you know, still elevated at almost two for the adjusted hazards ratio. Um, then in model two, we looked at patients who were, had a negative FIT test and again found that having colon cancer itself was a strong predictor of developing an upper GI cancer in the adjusted hazards ratio of almost 13 actually, although this confidence interval is very wide um, and so these, because the numbers are quite small, these estimates are likely somewhat unstable. And these findings further reinforce that proximal cancers may actually be more prevalent in patients who have colon cancer or, colon, or colorectal neoplasia. Um, and so those patients who are, have a positive FIT test, you know, having a colon neoplasia doesn't necessarily preclude you from having an upper GI cancer as well. Um, so, you know, some of our key takeaways from this study was that uh, positive fit is an independent predictor itself of proximal GI cancer risk with an almost three times higher risk um, of developing an upper GI cancer compared to a negative fit with a three-year risk of 0.25% versus 0.07%. Contrary to what we were initially thinking, we found that colorectal cancer itself was an independent predictor of developing an upper GI cancer as well in both the fit positive patients as well as the fit negative patients. Um, and furthermore, it was those FIT positive patients who had colorectal neoplasia that ultimately had the highest risk of, of developing a proximal GI cancer in this study. Um, so, you know, this study does support the findings from the 2020 Korean study, um, which was much larger than the Dutch study. So it's, it's possible that the Dutch study might have been somewhat underpowered to, defect, to detect this effect size. Um, and, you know, interestingly, colon cancer association with upper GI cancer risk has been shown in some prior epidemiologic studies, which show some higher rates of metachronous stomach and small intestine cancers in patients with colon cancer. Um, and some of the possible mechanisms have included, you know, genetic predispositions that may not necessarily be a hereditary cancer syndrome, um, as well as shared behavioral risk factors um, or under, underlying kind of pro-inflammatory mechanisms um, that warrant further study. Um, nonetheless, I think it's important to keep in mind that even in this study, the absolute risk of proximal GI cancer was still quite low and overall comparable to the risks that we extrapolated from SEER data, um, which was about a three-year overall risk of 0.21%. Um, and so, you know, you know, when I've been presenting the study, people ask me, what should we take away from the study? Should we be doing an upper endoscopy on everyone who has a fit? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Um, but I, you know, I do think that based on our findings, fit positive patients may comprise a higher risk cohort for proximal GI cancers. And you know, when we see them in clinic, we should carefully evaluate them for possible upper GI symptoms or alarm symptoms or risk factors for upper GI cancers that could possibly warrant them for upper endoscopy with their colonoscopy.
Um, so some of the strengths of our study um, were that we included a large and diverse population with adequate power to detect the difference that we were looking for. We used robust definitions for our outcomes for both the exposure as well as the um, as our primary outcome. And we tried to address possible systematic selection bias in the patient cohort, uh, looking at patients who didn't have an available fit result. We also really tried hard to minimize gaps in follow-up um, using only the continuous enrollment time of the fit. Um, however, you know, there were certainly some limitations, including that this was a single commercial insurer. There are not really any procedures or diagnoses outside of this database. And of course, with ICD-based primary outcomes, some cancers may be misclassified. Um, and we didn't include any non-neoplastic pathology that could possibly uh, cause occult blood loss. And so in the future, um, you know, we're actually working on some further analyses stratifying the analyses by race and ethnicity to see if the predictive power of fit uh, uh, may change um, between ethnic groups. Um, we also are uh, currently incorporating upper GI symptoms or alarm symptoms as a possible confounder. Um, so looking forward to uh, being able to analyze the data with those pieces of, uh, with those pieces of data incorporated. Um, and I think in the future, you know, trying to identify additional risk factors for proximal GI cancers and fit positive patients and identifying risk factors for proximal GI cancers after colon cancer diagnosis, even um, if there are patients who may benefit from a simultaneous endoscopy at the time of their surveillance colonoscopy. And ultimately, um, looking at the cost effectiveness of trying to do simultaneous bidirectional endoscopy could be helpful as well. Um, so I just want to acknowledge a lot of my co-authors, Dr. Yuri Ladebaum, who's my primary uh, mentor at Stanford, um, Dr. Singh, Dr. Huang, um, and Stanford GI. So thanks so much for your time. I know we're running late. Let's see, I do see a question. <clears throat> Mike, I'll just read it. Do we have, it says, do we have any info about the staging of proximal GI cancers in fit positive patients? I'm wondering if advanced metastatic proximal GI cancers have a higher chance of causing a positive fit. That's a great question. Um, I have not come across any data about, or let's see, um, I guess I think the Netherlands study might have included some data on staging and there, it, it wasn't particularly interesting and, you know, they didn't find a difference overall. The Korean study did not, did not have any data about staging, but I think that's a great question because that would make, you know, some mechanistic sense as well. Um, but unfortunately, with a lot of these like registry data, there's not or databases, there's not that much information about staging. Um, yeah, Mike, if there's any other questions, happy to take them. Maybe just I'll just ask you one quick question, which is, yeah. were you guys able to potentially control for like um, um, like Lynch syndrome, for example? You know, yeah. The con other conditions that lead you to have more likelihood of having cancers in both proximal and distal uh, intestinal tract. Yeah, um, so uh, I don't know, like coding for those syndromes is really quite bad, uh, is what I learned when I was trying to, when I was trying to do that. And so, um, and I'm currently like revising my analyses to incorporate um, whatever ICD codes exist for hereditary cancer syndromes, like family history of cancers, but there's really like, it's like very poorly coded. And so even when I incorporate that, it makes no difference with the results. Yeah, but obviously that's a huge, yeah, limitation. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, Dr. Zoe, yeah. Dr. Bath, Dr. Cho, for participating in this and, and teaching us so much and spending the time with us. Um, if, uh, if there are any other questions, please just send a message over to us, and then we can always forward it to, to the, the lecturers. All right. Um, have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Mike.